I'm going to tell you all about the one thing I wish I knew when I started making multiplayer games in Godot. Authority. We've got a really cool project here with a server, a client, and another client. And we're going to learn about what it takes to sync data. Multiplayer is all about maintaining a shared world state. And to do that, we need to send updates about objects in the game. What we have here is what's called client authority. The client has the say over where the objects are, in this case, the player object. You can see that their ID above them is what they have authority over. The server is ID 1, and it has authority over these rocks and things like that. If I restart the project and we join in, we can see how this works. The server is going to start up first. And in the server is going to be the world with our rocks. And when we join, the server is going to listen for peers connecting via the multiplayer peer. When a player joins, they get authority over their player object. Here comes another peer. He's got authority too. That means that their position, rotation, and any other things that are in the multiplayer synchronizer are coming from them. Let's take a look at some of the code that makes this work. At the top of our file, we have our ENet multiplayer peer. That's great for this client and server approach that we're using. When we start our server, we are going to listen for this multiplayer peer connected signal. That is going to then add player. If we look at our add player command, it's going to take that peer ID of the person who just connected, that client ID, and you see that number floating above their head. When we add a new player, we instantiate the scene, and then we give the player the name of that peer ID that's passed in. So when that player gets added to the tree, they take that name, which is now this number, and they, very importantly, set multiplayer authority. That means that everything about this player character is now going to be the authority of that peer ID, that number. Everything in this multiplayer synchronizer here, the position, the rotation, velocity, all of that is going to come from that person's machine, that client. We've also got something here in our ready function. I've got this catch, if not is multiplayer authority, set process false, set physics process false. What this does is this turns off this character on machines that are not the authority. So you can think of me, I have authority over my character body on my machine, but that character body also exists on other clients. And I like to think of these as puppets. We wanna turn off the processing and the physics and stuff like that on those other puppets because I'm the authority, I get to say what my position, my rotation, my velocity, all these things, I am going to send updates to those puppets. And we can turn those things off because they don't need to run on those puppet machines because I'm broadcasting all of the updates that they need. This makes it a little bit more efficient uh, and can simplify things sometimes. RPCs can be a little easier to work with when you've got a good grasp of multiplayer authority. For example, we've got this interact, which is called on a rock from the player. The current interactable dot interact dot RPC ID one means we're going to call this interact RPC on the server. This ID one we know is the server and it's going to call it straight to the server. Let's take a look at what it does. We have this RPC can be called by any peer reliably and it's going to request pickup only on the server though. The server is going to get the remote sender ID, which we know looks like this peer ID, and it's going to set the owner so that it can then track where the owner is and set where the rock moves. We can also call syncsound.rpc, and since there's no ID there, we know that's a broadcast. That's going to sync it to all people from the authority. The authority is the one who can call it. It's going to call remote to all the peers and play the sound. I've found that a pattern like this can really simplify things and eliminate bugs and make sure that someone is always responsible for the data, for receiving it, and for broadcasting it. Once you've got this working really well, where your clients are very flexible and they can drop in, we can actually take this client and do a lot of really cool things with it. For one, we can host. And so people want to know, like, um, how do I host a game? Usually I like to point them to this server and client approach so that they have a really flexible client. And once you do have a flexible client, you can drop a client anywhere. 
you can drop a client on to your server with the ID one. So it's a very independent encapsulated player. And when we launch this, we can add a new player with ID one and it's just going to work. This is now more of like a peer to peer setup, right? It's just a new player with a different ID. I've talked a lot about client authority and it's something I do recommend like the clients having control over their player bodies, but you might have heard about server authority, and there are really good reasons why you might want to use a fully server authoritative approach, but it comes with trade-offs. Let's show how we could do a server authoritative approach. For one, we could make all of the player bodies uh, the authority one. This means that the server is going to own and ultimately be responsible for all of the updates of the position, the rotation, all of the things that this character body right here, he's going to be one. Um, that's fine, but like now we don't have any way to tell the server where this player should be from the client. They, the client has no authority. That's why we would use something like this input node. And then we would dot set multiplayer authority and we would int name. And what this would do was then going to set just the authority over this input node. And you would then in there create the process of collecting your inputs. And that means the client could then send WASD through a multiplayer synchronizer that you would say like, okay, um, here is input. And then I would select my uh, is W pressed, right? That sort of thing would now be the responsibility of the client. And this is great for server authority because it would be able to prevent uh, players from saying exactly where they were. They would have to then send their inputs, the server processes it, and says, okay, yeah, I'm going to move this player here. What this does is create a round trip situation where the player is sending in their input, the server is receiving it and then broadcasting it back down uh, via position and rotation to that player body. That means you're going to want to look into a uh, client side synchronization where the inputs are executed at the same time on the server and on the client. So that would be NetFox, uh, lag compensation, all those advanced topics are gonna now come in. There are gonna be good reasons to pick a client authoritative or a server authoritative approach. Uh, I personally think that uh, client authoritative just over the player bodies can be a good like middle ground for casual games. And if you've got to deal with like cheating or competitive gaming, you're definitely going to want to go with a server authoritative approach. Uh, I've done both and there are good reasons to do both. Um, but, you know, keep researching and do their, your, uh, make your own decisions. Now that we understand the server, the client, and we've got a really robust client, we can put them into a peer to peer connection using web RTC multiplayer peer. This is a really cool little demo and I've got some other videos on it if you're interested. But what this is going to do is it's going to create a mesh connection with no server involved. But we still have to have a multiplayer authority over each object in the game. What's really cool about this is that it starts off with this, you know, 1-4 ID over everything. The 1-4 ID is the person who created the game, but he's not the ultimate owner. I can pick something up and it's going to assign me as the multiplayer owner here. And then if anything spawns in, we're going to see that, oh, yep, it's a different ID. But if I pick it up, now I am the multiplayer authority over this. I get to decide where it goes. This created a really nice effect where this peer could be doing things over here and having a really responsive experience and any lag that he is experiencing isn't carrying over to these other peers because they might be interacting with this or even this where we have a cart here kind of a bonus feature you can see 157 owns that and then 62 comes over here and picks it up it's now his to drive around so he can actually uh dictate where that rotation that Sinking all that physics, that's his responsibility as long as he's controlling it. Creates a, a responsive and kind of distributed uh, authority setup. I hope you enjoyed this demo and seeing what set multiplayer authority can do. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and like and subscribe. I've really enjoyed seeing comments, so go ahead and drop one of those. Ask me questions. I'll be happy to respond, and uh, good luck making multiplayer games.